in Hiroshima, Japan, and I'm so excited to talk to these three amazing artists that we have here with us today, and they will be introducing their work. And recently, they had an exhibit in Hiroshima, and so they're talking about their philosophy and their artwork, and let's get going. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Would you like to introduce yourself? Go ahead and yeah. start. Ava, how about you? Start it. Okay. Um, so my name is Ava Grawls, and I'm an artist in London. I'm a South African-Belgian artist, and uh, we brought over an exhibition to Hiroshima uh, looking at diaspora and our connection with uh, crossing borders. So that's why we're really interested to bring something from London, but also in between Japan and London. So we started to do something like that. I'll let the other artists introduce themselves as well. All um, right, go ahead. Who's next? Jump yeah, on in. Hi. hi. Um, I don't know if I should uh, introduce all my practice, but hi, I'm uh, Megumi Ohata. Um, I'm Japanese and Korean mix. Uh, my practice explores gender identity and post-human philosophy, confronts personal traumas, and um, ranging from the effects of child abuse and gender struggles to the dis discrimination I've faced due to my Asian heritage. Um, yeah, in Edge, I was exhibiting this Howry piece <laughs> with feet hanging, which you can't really see at the moment. But yeah, nice to meet you, everyone. Nice. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Um, hi, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my, I'm Makiko Harris. I'm uh, from San Francisco, California, now live in London. I'm half Japanese and half American. Um, my work uh, is transdisciplinary, cross painting, sculpture, installation, and sound. And in the exhibition in Hiroshima, I presented a series of six paintings uh, leveraging uh, uh, familial uh, kimonos as the base for the paintings. Wonderful. Nice to be here, thank you. Yeah, thanks, great to have you all. And I would love to hear, and I'm sure all of our viewers as well, a little bit of background about how you got together for this exhibit. All of your artwork is so different, but so connected as well. I'm excited to hear more of your insights about how it all began and your philosophy. Um, we all met at the Royal College of Art in London. And um, I think uh, I met Makiko first and we were talking a lot about um, being immigrants and making art outside of our culture or feeling a little bit disconnected from where we're supposed to be from. And then later on, uh, we included Megumi, seeing that their work was also looking at, at the same subject. So we deal with all the same subject matter, but all our artwork goes in different directions. But the, the essence or the heart of it is trying to figure out how you create cultural work with across cultural boundaries. So we're not really in the center of anything. We're always on the periphery of things. I don't know, how do you guys feel about that explanation? <laughs> Oh, that Does that easy. work for you? Yeah. That's great. Ava, since you're in the hot spot, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your work and then we'll take turns? Okay. Um, my work for this piece precisely was Floating Fortresses. And it's a giant map of Japan and the UK. And I was looking at um, the idea of borders and boundaries and how people consider themselves, their culture and their identity as part of the nation they come from. And the, the work was for an exhibition called Edge and it's looking at people on the peripheries who have trouble be belonging to that stereotype of the nation that they were supposed to come from. And I'm always looking at the geography of people who make maps and how those maps actually tend to divide people more than bring them together. So the idea of floating fortresses is empire nations and, and the feeling of exceptionalism, but not belonging to any other land-based countries next to them. So that feeling of segregation or separation. And I wanted to make a giant monumental map so that people would look at this as a, a kind of religious stained glass window and think, you know, this is so awe-inspiring. Awe this is huge. How do I 
think about myself as an independent individual within these kind of heavy narratives of the nation. And yeah, I made on Soji paper, which is a Japanese sliding door paper, and it's also oil and watercolors. So the combination of Nihonga art and also Western art kind of brings this dialogue together in the more material aspect of it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much. I want the others to also introduce their work. So <laughs> I'm just going to stop there for now and then let you guys talk a bit more. Yeah, that's great. And we'll show some photos, of course, of all of your wonderful work as well. Uh, Megumi, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Ooh, okay. Um, so for this particular edge exhibition, I exhibited this installation of Haori. It's like a kimono jacket. Um, and this, this is like a distinctive textile piece imprinted with my own skin texture. And then I hang together with the feet that is also casted by my own feet um, and it derives into personal traumas but also the the expatriate unsettling sensation of like homelessness and reminiscent of like floating like a ghost kind of feeling so yeah I put those like everything kind of together with uh, my fascination towards a non-human being as well and I make like artwork as an extension of my body. So I kind of put everything together. Yeah. Wow, sounds amazing. I'm looking forward to going through the photos and, and hearing you guys explain what we're seeing in the photos a bit later. Wonderful. Makiko? Great, thank you. So my work Overall, some themes that I explore are th this hybridity or an ambiguous identity based on mixed cultural heritages, also cultural legacy and inheritance as it relates to a contemporary feminism. And so, as I mentioned, I'm half Japanese and half American, um, and I engage with the world from a position that's quite ambiguous and multiple. And I think at times I've not felt sort of this right or a privilege to be able to use um, such a culturally significant artifact such as a kimono. But earlier this year, I inherited all of my family kimonos and they were these amazing textiles that had been worn by generations of women in my family. Um, and I, de I decided to start thinking about what those surfaces mean, what those cultural um, uh, inheritances mean. Um, so I scanned these kimonos in a very high-res scanner and then they were expanded. Um, the largest paintings in the series were three meters tall. So quite uh, large scale works, um, which were uh, <laughs> quite a challenge to bring over to Japan, but that was a fun uh, project for all of us. Um, and in the work also, I'm using a family a stencil of a family crest. Um, so again, kind of, this is a family crest that was uh, embroidered on the nape of the neck as well as the sleeve of the kimono, but then I'm leveraging it in a new way. Again, the scale is quite different, quite um, bombastic, uh, and I'm using a stenciling, a spray paint type of technique, um, sort of a street art graffiti style. Um, so again, I think now I'm embracing that discomfort and ambivalence in feeling like can I own this cultural heritage or not? Um, and using that ambivalence as fuel towards the conception of the work. And I hope that viewers can think about um, contradictions in their own subject when they're viewing um, this work. Thank you. Wow, that's so interesting. All of you guys, amazing. I really enjoyed listening to your descriptions. Uh, just a shout out, we have Maria. Asebu, who's joined us. Thanks so much for joining us on Facebook. It's wonderful to see you here. Uh, of course, as always, add any questions or comments you have, and we'll try to address them. This is live, so we are going as, as it happens. You're sharing it with us. Uh, should we start with the slides? And you guys take turns uh, explaining what we're looking at. So this is a view of the gallery in Hiroshima, right? Yeah, so this is Gallery G, and I had uh, exhibited there 10 years ago when I finished my contract as an English teacher in Hiroshima. And I exhibited with a, uh, a fellow mosaic artist who actually had come back 
to help us this time with both with translating and moving stuff around, Miki Kikimoto. And it was good to go back to that relationship and use the space in a new way because we knew the size of the gallery. And also Hiroshima is where it all started because when I was teaching, people said, can you make us a South African meal? And I was like, I only cook European food. So there's all this kind of weird, what am I supposed to do to be South African, you know? and and this kind of concept built itself in this type of gallery and we all decided where to put our work to make people see it in respect to that. Where we're looking at the angle from top down, uh, were people able to come up and see the art from above as well? Yeah, there's this tiny little room that you can walk up via the stairs at the back and it's like a balcony room. So there's one little exhibit at the top bit and then you go down, but it's it's a massive cube. It's almost like an Instagram cube. It's like one by one ratio. So it's quite a unique space with a massive window. And yeah, it's mass it's just a square. <laughs> What an interesting space. And with all your different styles, uh, did it feel like it, it worked well to be in this small space together? Do, do you, one of you guys want to answer? <laughs> I'd be happy to answer. I think absolutely we were able to successfully use the space. I think um, something also that I just want to mention was the site specific nature of it. So especially Ava's work, which is the large uh, pink painting um, in the far left background of the photo, um, was measured specifically for the front windows, which are double height. So it's two stories tall in the front of the gallery and the light coming through the paintings, kind of um, imbuing that sense of color and um, like that womb-like sensibility, I'll let Ava speak to it more, but just saying, you know, we did plan this exhibition specifically for this space as well. So it was really exciting to finally be able to install it. That's so amazing. I wish more designers did that when they design buildings to take in what space you're, you're gonna take up, right? Um, so that's amazing. And such a great location because you're in between two uh, wonderful sites in Hiroshima city, between the castle and one of our most beautiful gardens, Shukayan Gardens. Uh, did you, so what was the reaction when people came in? Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, during the time that you were showing the art and had people in there. What was it like? Maybe Megumi, tell us a little bit about your experience here. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, I got a lot of um, insightful comments from the audience. Um, particularly from this Nihonga artist called Kishin Funada regarding the historical tradition of Japan during the Muromachi and Edo period, which was really interesting because I think those insights are really rare to hear and I, I would have to read a lot of books to know about it. So, and especially about my focus on yokai, which is the Japanese folklore cultures. He was also like mentioning about the cultures really well, like really insightful. And we also got um, invited to his studio after. Um, and it was like a really privilege of viewing his father's beautiful traditional Nihonga works. And we even also had a connection with um, a saxophonist called Kazuya Kato, who played music inspired by our show at the gallery space. So it was really nice. The community there was really beautiful um, and really peaceful as well at the same time. Yeah, and everyone was welcoming. That's wonderful. Uh, what are we looking at here? Um, this is a close up of a map. So this was uh, 5.6 meters of painting, <laughs> a lot of painting um, of oil and watercolors, which took about three weeks for the oil and watercolors to be made and dried. And the map was folded up in 20 centimeters exactly so that it would fall exactly in the square that it was supposed to be in the grid it was supposed to be. A lot of the pink uh, pigment of the watercolors 
would then, of course, become translucent when the paper was put in front of the, the window. And it turns the whole gallery into like this pink womb-like space. And I hope to create this kind of like psychoanalysis effect of this is a motherland or a father country. You're inside the womb of something. You feel secure. You feel like you belong. And also it turned everyone else's work pink. So I was speaking a lot to Makiko about what work that she would bring in so we could kind of incorporate it with the, the tone of the gallery. And then Megumi as well, their work is quite translucent. So that would work with this kind of floating pink color that goes through it. And then the oil itself is quite opaque. So you're only getting some of the light shining through and then some of it's being blocked out. So this is an, an oil section of a very large sheet. And there's six sheets that were painted. <laughs> wow. Like we can see in the first slide, right? So yeah. then this was a close up of one part. Yeah, wow. yeah. And then it can be folded up and it's about this size. And it can be put into your bag. So it's kind of like a migrational artwork. Wow. And this is what it looked like in the gallery. Yeah. So at nighttime, it lights up like a lantern. And it had a very good effect on some people. I think people enjoyed looking at it. And it's great because sometimes you don't always want the negative connotations to come through. You want people to feel good with art and feel like there's some kind of transformative effect. And some uh, lady was walking past at nighttime. She came into the gallery the next day and she said she'd been really unhappy, really troubled. And she'd stopped outside the gallery, which was closed and the light was on. And she'd, she'd kind of forgotten all the sadness. And she had to come back to the gallery to tell us this. And, and she spoke at length about how it made her feel in, in a way that maybe the problems don't seem that big anymore. And maybe I wonder if that was like looking at maps or looking at things far away and looking at the beauty of the world kind of disengages you of your, your everyday you know, troubles. So I was quite pleased and, and it was very kind of her to come back and, and tell us that the next day. And also the reflections were cool. <laughs> on the water I was like awesome that's amazing. well that's so wonderful I mean that so many people probably had that same experience but for her to make the effort to come back and tell you in person that was really wonderful and I'm sure that meant a lot to you yeah there was a lot of kindness in people who visited that's fantastic and this is Megumi your work yeah that's my work and Ava's behind. There was this little girl who was walking around. She was really cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's gorgeous. Yeah. I can speak to this slide. So yeah, please. there are three different images. Um, the one on the far left is the upstairs room. So I uh, here I have three of the small um, kimono paintings. So again, I'll just explain a little bit of how these were made. So they're large scale scans of these traditional kimonos that were actually worn by my family. I got a lot of comments and um, conversation, especially from older women who immediately recognized some of these patterns um, and styles of embroidery and things like that that were part of the original textiles and recognize them as a very traditional type of pattern that they said, oh, we don't you know, see that type of thing anymore. Even within kimonos themselves, there's a more maybe contemporary style that's available now. So that was really interesting that it was so immediately recognized. Um, and then on the floor, <clears throat> excuse me, on the floor uh, in that far left photo, is a small chain installation. So there was a theme of chains throughout both the paintings as well as in the work itself. There are also some chains in the middle photo as a fringe coming off of that uh, painting on the right. Um, the chains in my work symbolize this kind of connection to your heritage, um, to your family legacies that can be both uh, like a warm feeling, like a familial connection, but also potentially can be quite restricting. So it's that kind of double-edged sword conversation, something for people to think about as they're thinking about their own um, legacies, history, how does that uh, impact you? In the middle of photo are uh, is the first room. So as 
uh, guests walked in. This was kind of the first thing they saw after Ava's large painting in the window. So there are two large paintings on the left side. You're only seeing um, one of them in, uh, pictured there. And then uh, the large kimono painting on the back wall with the chain fringe. Um, again, you can see the chain motif painted on top of the kimonos, especially in that left painting, large painting there. And then the image in the right, we took a few photos before Ava put up the um, painting in the window just to get sort of different types of imagery, being able to capture the exhibition in different lights and, and different styles. Um, so here we're seeing the uh, gallery from the outside, looking in and seeing uh, my paintings reflected, of course, in the pool and uh, hung with Megumi's work. Wonderful. Yeah, it's nice to see the different reflections um, with the different work coming through the window. That's so wonderful. This is uh, fantastic, are these visitors? <laughs> yes, um, I usually invite people to touch my piece as um, I make my work that's like interacting for audiences and I wanted them to touch my piece as if they're touching someone gently, you know, that kind of like a care feeling. So, yeah. And it, you said you made the, the textile, do you call it a textile? The material is from your own skin texture. Yeah, so it, um, it really feels like skin. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I I touch them like almost every day, so I get confused <laughs> if this is like actually real textile that that you know the texture if it's like skin or not. But if you go to the probably the next slide, um, it might be my work. Yeah, these are like uh, photos taken by Asano-san, um, the local Hiroshima photographer. And yeah, so I hanged uh, my Haori piece and then the feet, it's a little bit creepy <laughs> and uncanny. But then also, as I feel like there's a connection to Makiko's chain, that the familiarity and also the struggle at the same time, you know, behind the, the piece. Um, and also like the rope also um, makes it a little bit more uh, familiar in a way that's like sense of death. And also, but as a Japanese tradition, there's the shibari, uh, which is like a fetishized uh, thing. So it's like a mixture of those as well. Wow. Now, I would love for you guys to comment on each other's work as well, if you feel like it, because you've worked together. Any comments on each other's work so far? Or doing this event together? Yeah. Um, so I think through this, we were always talking about themes and presentation. And I think when people were coming into the gallery, we were explaining each other's work, me in really broken and bad Japanese. <laughs> and the others in brief, fluent Japanese. Um, so uh, I found both their work is very interesting in the way that they're looking at the legacy of, of where they come from and they're trying to remake themselves in their artwork, whether it's like a garment. They're both garment oriented, textile oriented, which is, you know, I suppose also quite a feminine art. In, as opposed to building and architectural and the harder, more concrete um, textures that you're dealing with. And if you look at all of the work together, it had this kind of feeling that you're, you're wearing another identity or you're questioning the identity that you're putting on. And I, you know, as, as artists, I was watching Megumi is extremely precise with how they make things and, and the, the feet are, are intricately made <laughs> over a very long period of time. Each pore is made with a lot of care, you know, and, and if you take a picture of just the feet, you know, I sent it to my boyfriend and I was like, look at my feet and you, they look like real feet. And then you'd be like a joke and be like, it's not my feet, they're just hanging, <laughs> they're, they're false feet. But there's so much attention and detail made to these garments that, that they wear that 
it it looks real and you get a little bit confused and a little bit like uh <laughs> taken aback at your relationship with these things and mikiko as well i i really enjoy the colors and the vibrancy and this kind of like impact that this work gives you i felt a lot of the visitors were just being like wow as soon as they walk inside because there's a lot of like hitting sharp lines to her work and you can see that and then there's this like why the chain oh the chain <laughs> so there was a relationship with the the viewer going oh i think i know something of that feeling and it's starting to make sense to me that's wonderful makiko makiko would you like to comment on the other artist sure i just wanted to say overall we had i think an experience of visitors really engaging with our work very thoroughly that I think can be unusual in other types of exhibition settings. And we are really grateful to people who, some people came to our exhibit every day and really wanted to have in-depth conversations about the work, brought their children and brought their friends. And uh, we also had the opportunity to do an artist talk where we shared a little bit more in depth um, some of the things we're sharing today as well. Uh, which we delivered in both Japanese and English. Um, another one of the contacts we made with the uh, community was uh, I had reached out to some kind of local businesses and people in the artist community, inviting them to have a conversation with us, come visit the exhibition. Um, and one of the people we met was someone who runs the Hiroshima uh, Hiroshima artist brush manufacturing company. Um, they make traditional Japanese style calligraphy brushes and makeup brushes. Um, and uh, the man who runs the company was, was really kind enough to come visit our exhibition and have conversations with us about the technical aspect of the work too. You know, all three of us use very different techniques, even though we all do use different types of painting. Um, and we were grateful to make that connection as well. That's wonderful. It's great to hear of the the local connections you can make. Any other comments? Megumi, did you want to comment on the other artist's work? I just would like to thank you to both of the artists, uh, Ava and Makiko, um, and that uh, I really admire how they work and their beautiful artworks as well. Um, I I learn a lot from them. <laughs> so yeah, I'm really grateful for that too. But one thing is that I I thought this exhibition wouldn't have happened like like this well and recognized this much by a lot of people with without their effort that they put. So yeah, I'm really happy about that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, I would love for your, each of you to introduce uh, your Instagram page or your website, uh, just to give the viewers a little bit more, maybe about things that are up and coming as well, uh, if people want to follow and keep up with you. Anyone like to start? Who should, who should go first? You guys <laughs> decide. All right. Okay. I'll, uh, go. I'll, go. I'll go. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ava. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> this this is so a lot of my stuff's also researching like for the whole thing. The visit to Japan also was linked up with a, a farm stay with an old friend of mine, and a lot of it I'm looking at like sustainable economies. I'm looking at like um, artists who make work from a local perspective and in that way I'm trying to make my paintings match the site specific places that I go to and I recently made a painting called uh, South Towards the Dark Continent and because I'm South African it was really nice to put South Africa at the top of the world and, and not at the bottom <laughs> and look at Europe as the kind of dark continent the place that might need a bit of enlightenment for once um, and a lot of my paintings and my work is looking at trying to decolonize and reverse the narrative and look at a more like the smaller the perspective from the smaller person than these kind of powerful institutions and I'm going to have another exhibition called land sale where I will attempt to sell the UK again <laughs> 
I tried the first exhibition <laughs> and I sold half of the UK so far. And we're going to try and sell the other half, uh, depending on how successful we are. It's like the UK from the old map from um, imperial times mixed in with the Brexit vote. And you can buy maybe a square or two if you want a little reminder in your house uh, that you now own land. And, and when you buy these paintings, you're also invited to invade when you have time. You know, maybe you're just very busy. So um, the next exhibition will be at the old fire station in Oxford. And it's going to run for the month of January. And it's also looking at um, the, the old maps from South Africa, the mining towns, the towns that my father worked at, um, as a kind of cheaper property. And they're made from these uh, Google images of um, mined out landscapes, where there's just these massive holes that the, a lot of British orientated companies came in, took what they wanted, and then left. So this is going to be my, my next ex exhibition, followed by um, what was the farm stay. So work from Mukaishima and from uh, Thomas's farm is going to be hanging in the Royal Scottish Academy at some point next year, but we don't know when. <laughs> wow, that's a great connection. Uh, Thomas has been on the show talking about no-till farming and organic farming, as well as uh, natural textiles. And uh, yeah, that's a wonderful connection for you, Eva. Thank you so much. Uh, Megumi, do you want to go next? Yeah, of course. Um, it's my page on there. Okay. Oh, great. So I'm an artist and also a special effects make makeup artist. Um, so I do both and people can choose whichever they would like to see. Um, if you go to artworks and, um, yeah, if you go to artwork, then you can see all my work. Um, but yeah, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so my artistic process is introspective, symbolizing the act of extracting parts from my own body, uh, both physically and psychologically, and progress progressively <laughs> transforming them into artwork. Um, and with within this, in my journey to reconcile these traumatic experiences that I mentioned earlier, um, I questioned the role of artists in escaping society's negative cycle and poses the question of what does the body need to be relatable? So I always think of like these body parts and then how I can try and make it into an artwork, those kind of like interaction between it. Um, I did, I do start selling <laughs> works too, which is a little bit tricky because it's made out of silicone, most of them. Um, but yeah, you can just look through my Instagram and my website and you can see everything there yeah that's amazing very interesting so unique and inspiring and all three of you studied in the same place that's the connection right in london yes yeah fantastic makiko you want to go next yep sure um i'll wait until yeah the instagram is fine um, yeah, lots of exciting projects coming up. My practice is quite broad. Um, I do some commercial work as well, um, also some music work. Uh, so uh, upcoming soon, I have a brand collaboration launching on a week from today, next Thursday, um, for which I'm making a gigantic oversized soft, uh, soft chain sculpture. So you know, again, that chain motif uh, and that particular collaboration, we're discussing um, connection between people and uh, that link that I was talking about. Um, so kind of thinking about this work and all the different types of um, environments and conversations that it can be a part of. So I'm quite excited to think about it in a new way. Um, and then after that project, I have a solo show upcoming in Vienna with Common Sense Gallery, which will be running for the month of December. Um, that will be a mix of 
also some soft sculptures, some tabletop sculptures, which I started uh, during um, my time at the RCA, and paintings that will be more towards my abstract painting practice. Uh, January, I'll be delivering an artist talk in San Francisco. Um, I will speak to some of the work that we did in Hiroshima. Um, lovely to bring it full circle. There's quite a large uh, community of Japanese people in the Bay Area of California, um, especially mixed race people as well. So I'm excited to discuss that. Um, and what else is happening in January? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, uh, I'll also be back in the Bay Area. I am co-curating a show in the East Bay in Oakland, um, which will be happening in March. Uh, but uh, I have a co-curator, another painter um, from San Francisco who I'm working on this with. We're really excited about the roster of artists we've pulled together. Um, it's all women and gender non-binary artists with a focus on um, artists of color and queer artists. Um, we, there's still uh, a lot of disparity in the art world, no matter how much we talk about it, especially at the highest echelons of, of showing your work and selling your work. So I think the one thing we can do about it is just be part of the change. So I'm excited about that upcoming project as well. Also, I forgot, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, I forgot go ahead. that there's two shows ongoing for mine as well. Uh, one in HSBC HQ, which is really interesting, and the other one is nearby the Thames Water um, uh, Courage Yard. So it's about um, it's also about the expat artist and mostly East Asian, Southeast Asian artist show. And also there's another upcoming show in December. So please check out my Instagram. There's all the information is on there. So yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. I would love to hear how you guys get your work finished. A lot of artists often talk about so many ideas, right? And how do you choose which one to focus on, which one to bring to fruition? Uh, where do you get your inspiration and how do you motivate yourself to stay on track and get the projects done? Anyone want to comment on that? I can speak to that. I, <laughs> I, um, let's see. I try to write down as many ideas as possible, so I keep notebooks everywhere. Um, I think that I see ideas as as things to capture and like not necessarily have to action on them right now but then maybe when i have a project come up or a particular assignment i can go through that whole all those different notebooks and think about what would be a good fit for this particular moment um, and then besides that i guess it's just curiosity so if i don't have a particular project or a deadline what holds my curiosity the most and trying to see that through and trying to present that in the best light um, i can when it's finished in terms of it getting the interaction and engagement with people as much as possible. So it's not the most clear answer, but it's no, a complete no, jumble. I, <laughs> I do my best. Also color-coded spreadsheets. Color-coded <laughs> spreadsheets, I like it. Yeah, I find, I find that you can um, work on three projects at once. <laughs> and then one of them will arrive. And it's also the experience. So I've got a really good idea of what to do for like an idea of foreign bodies from being in Japan. So I feel like the traveling is really useful and getting out there and mixing with people or a conversation I had with someone in a bar and I'll be like, this is something that can fit really well with something. I might keep it in the back of my mind until there's an opportunity, but all the time working on three projects and then, you know, sometimes some of them fall away because it's not the right time for them. And other times, other projects that started off as mine have become really important for them to come up now. So I feel like what I'm dealing with now is all the projects that the public see will be what you think is the best time for the stuff to come forward. But you have this massive work and backlog that you kind of keep behind for when the time is right. And everyone's like, oh, what do you do as an artist? And you're like, I am doing a lot, but you're only seeing just about this much. <laughs> yeah, Megumi? For me, I feel like having an idea is always from when I focus on like 
one lens, for example, when I think about skin, then I'll with the skin. For example, what if I am embroider like my own skin? That kind of like idea comes. <laughs> yeah, and then I start testing it. And then if I once start doing something, then there's the next step I want to go to. Like it's like forcing my brain to do like go into next step and then and then <laughs> so it's like non-stop and then you keep on going and then finally like you feel semi-fulfilled <laughs> and then you go next like that kind of process probably works well for me that's wonderful any advice that you guys would give budding artists out there or people who want to take it to the next level uh doing exhibitions like this is that an important part of your creative process you think yeah it develops an end goal and it, it stops you from the process of just consistently working um it's also incredibly hard to do and i think that's a challenge in itself to try and reach a goal with your work and get it to the public and deal with um, the public accessing your work but also you have to make sure that you you're happy where you are so you're not too vulnerable so there's a lot of self-consciousness and in, in artists starting out as is my work good enough or that kind of imposter syndrome and you're very worried about what people think so when you're creating the art you need to block everyone out and just concentrate on what you're doing but when you get to the exhibition stage that is the point when you can speak more confidently about what you've been working on because you spent that time and it's just a lot a lot of work a lot of reading a lot of visiting other galleries and trying to to figure out where you are in the world of culture and art and, and how what you have to say might contribute to what is going on around you. Makiko, anything to add? This is going to sound silly, but I would just say just keep making. Just don't, um, don't get discouraged too early and, and don't give up. I was making work and working as an artist 10 years before I decided to go back and do my MA. Um, and honestly, being uh, not, you know, not deciding to pursue a, a BA or an MA in art is also fine as well. There are lots of successful artists out there who are self-taught. I think it's fine to pursue your own path and um, just don't drop out of the game. If it's what you love, just keep doing it. And, you know, eventually you, I think the path becomes clear of what is meant for you in terms of um, uh, how to be an artist in the world. I think there's really no wrong way to do it. It makes it a bit difficult to figure out what your path is, but there's really no wrong way to do it. That's wonderful. Megumi? Um, I feel like both you guys said the most important part already. But another thing I would say, I would add is that make connections with other artists because artists are usually like alone. There are duo, but <laughs> we we work alone and it's it's like battling with yourself, with your, you know, the, you know, there's like a lot of people who might have like mental breakdown from working too much and focusing in the studio. Um, it's really nice to have some you know chat with your studio mate or like you know feedback from them having a community is really important and then it will expand and then you will find like a lot of other possibilities from there there might be a collaboration those kind of thing so it's like keep it up and people will notice about you and you will find a right community there that's wonderful and the million dollar question is can you make a living from being an artist or are all of you kind of doing side hustles as well to keep your art dream going? <laughs> I can speak to this. I'm actually quite passionate about this and I think that the art world could use with a lot more transparency about how people make it work. And I think it depends what your goals are. Like you can absolutely make a living as an artist, but it may mean you're doing more commercial work or you're um, you're really focused on making, you know, collections or bodies of work that are released online and sold, um, and you may have less time for research. I think nothing is black and white. Again, it just depends what your personal goals are. Um, some people may choose to have a second job, like you said, or perhaps teach, or perhaps work in an adjacent field. 
um, to focus on a more research-based practice. Again, I think there's no wrong way to do it. I personally, I also have a, um, a digital design, like consulting freelance practice. Uh, so I do some work in tech. I do a little bit of commercial work in the arts, like I mentioned, um, and then I combine that with more kind of academic research-based projects like this one as well. I personally quite like the mix of all three. Um, and yeah, I, th I think there are lots of different ways to make it work. So um, to especially to young people, I think that the story around, hey, you can't make a living as an artist can be really damaging because it prevents people from wanting to pursue that path. It took me a long time to decide to pursue it full, like as my primary thing too. And I think that that route would perhaps may have been less circuitous had we not received some of these messages growing up. Great. Yeah, I feel like it's it's useful to to have different professions. Like like myself, I do both um, art and also special effects. So and for to to make my work, it's it's really important to have the special effects makeup techniques. And so as I do it as a technician and also as a artist like it's really useful like makiko of like obviously i can see that there's the design skill that she learned and you know <laughs> pursued is in the painting it's really beautifully done so that kind of like i think i think you your work might get in a way might get a stronger sense of you in it by having like different professions like ava also have a uh, really cool technical skills <laughs> so <laughs> you can talk about it um i think that the, the age of the genius artist has passed where it's a guy just you know getting money off the state and having coffees and making art i don't think we we have that option anymore but i think also we're doing other jobs so i'm a, an av technician and it helps me produce a show in another country and apply for funding and work with a group of people and deal with the logistics of trying to build a stretcher in a foreign country, buying wood, moving wood, when my language skills are, are very limited. But because I'm used to operations and running things, it's, it's been very useful to have those jobs. But the nice thing about being an artist is you don't have an expiry date. You can be an artist for as long as you want. You can retire and be an artist. So it's like a long game. You're not playing for like making a super amount of money now. If if you want a really long career, you can always have other jobs that are going to feed into your practice. But you don't have to worry about what you're achieving until you hit 30 or until you hit 40. You can do it forever. And I think that's what's the most comforting thing about this kind of career is, is that not even a career it's just like a lifestyle where you're always going to be producing something so it's useful to have a bit of financial backup and multiple work streams because everyone needs security and everyone needs a house or a rent to pay and it's understandable it's very difficult when you're doing so you know like we might be talking about oh yeah i'm an artist i sell my paintings i can pay my rent it's not true you have to do lots of different things to keep your secure income coming in but doesn't mean you have to restrict your practice when you paint. You just have to find time and find the people that will help you produce as you carry on. That's all great insights. And I'm, I'm sure these are the questions a lot, like you said, a lot of young artists are really thinking about and uh, going through school, paying for education and not sure you're going to make it work uh, once you graduate, right? You guys are such an inspiration. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of the Japan trip and coming to Hiroshima, are there any things that like really touched you or inspired you about being in Hiroshima, being in Japan and showing your work in particular? <laughs> um, I, I really miss Hiroshima. It's my old town. And so I was super happy to see everyone again. But I have noticed that the art community is changing a lot. Instagram is making it easier to approach uh, native Japanese speakers in the art world, which we didn't have that kind of access before. We only had line and you'd have to get a phone number of someone. So um, Mikiko is really brilliant at this kind of stuff, was able to reach out to a lot of people that we wouldn't have been able to talk to. Um, I used to teach at Kumano where the Fude, you know, Fude Matsuri and the, the brush 
you know, like what you do with the painting. And then the gentleman comes along and we meet him through the Instagram, you know. So we don't, I didn't have those contacts anymore because it was 10 years on. And Hiroshima was becoming more of a, a really strong art scene in that. I went to Tamantai Gallery. And that's a, just a really old building that the landlord doesn't want to fix anymore. So he's giving the rooms out as studios and he's given one of the spaces out as a gallery. So they're using local spaces to create like non-institutional art spaces to keep a more consistent and sustainable art community together because you don't have to rely on funding from another source. So these things that I felt were very new and very fresh, but I don't know if they were always there and I just noticed them now. <laughs> That's great to hear. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, yeah, I can go next. Um, I felt like Hiroshima, people in Hiroshima are so kind and so nice. And they we, we were handing our flyers to a lot of places because we were kind of worried like how many people will actually come and see our show. Most of the people who we hand a flyer to came for us. And some people actually got us like little snacks and gift. And they're so lovely. Like I really want to go back already. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's like, and also I found out like a lot of people are really like international. It's like a junction now. And I, I really like that too, that the fact that we could actually exhibit in somewhere that that's like that. And also our audiences were both like Japanese and also mix mixture and also foreigners, like variety of them were there. And I really enjoyed that community. Wonderful, thanks. Makiko? Yeah, same thing. I think I was really impressed by sort of the international perspective in Hiroshima, um, uh, especially lots of people who came out to our uh, opening. Um, a lot of really interesting conversations. Many students came, many people from the university. Um, I think lots of people there who are really thinking uh, deeply about some of the things we were discussing in, in the exhibition, you know, what, what do borders mean? Um, what does... Uh, cultural legacy mean, especially in the context of all the historical things that have happened in Hiroshima. So in many ways, it was really um, an amazing place for us to have the privilege of showing. That's great. Uh, we just have a few more minutes. It's been so wonderful hearing all of your insights about your work and about Japan and Hiroshima and uh, your work and making it work as, as a job, as a career as well. I think um, there's so many things that people who are listening will be able to, to put into their own lives, whether they're artists or not. I think uh, a lot of people, even writers, uh, often have the same kind of thinking, right? Can I, can I make it work as a writer? Can I make it work as anything that you feel passionate about, I think? Um, I love all of your advice. Thank you all so much for joining and sharing all your insights. Thanks. And thanks for your advice on where we could make the stretches. That was really useful. We went to Conan. <laughs> Good. I'm glad it worked out. And I'm so glad to hear you had such a warm welcome in Hiroshima. I think Hiroshima is a very special place. I've called home for many years. And we would welcome you all back anytime. So please come back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. And I will add all of the links below that we talked about. And uh, thanks for sharing your wonderful photos. And we hope to see you back in Japan sometime soon. Definitely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank Thanks, everyone, for joining. See you again next time. Thank you. Bye.